Okay, good. So welcome to this uh, afternoon or last uh, talk of the afternoon of this uh, Christmas workshop. We have the pleasure to have with us uh, Manfred Lingner from Max Planck Institute for Physics in Heidelberg. He's going to speak uh, on behalf of the external collaboration about the external one tone excess uh, interpretations and theoretical implications. You already know Manfred, so the, the talk I'm sure it would be great and very interesting. So please, Manfred, your turn. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me well? Sure. Let's go. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. Okay, great. So thanks for this kind of invitation. As I said, it was an invitation actually to the external cooperation and then um, was noticed that this is mostly theorist here. And of course, people that know me, I'm, I'm working both sides. So I was just the person to, to, to show up and give this talk. So my talk will be to uh, explain to the excess the inter uh, and then go into interpretations and theoretic implications going all the way, so to say. And it's gonna be about this very beautiful experiment here and I can tell you, being co-spokesperson of, spokesperson of this experiment, I could give you a talk on every one of these subsystems, but that's not what you want. I think we want to see what the evidence is, what it's based on, and then where it takes us, if you take it as, a, as an indication for something new. So that's what I'm going to, to, to try to go now. It starts off with experimental things initially, and then it, in the end, I will move more, more into interpretations. I don't have to explain to this audience what the uh, dark matter problem is. We have this cosmic ma matter balance, radiation, chemical elements, neutrinos, stars, amazingly little, only 0.8% for many people, hydrogen, helium, gas, about 4%. And then there's this dark matter component that we talk about, something invisible in addition to the cosmic neutrino background and dark energy. And our tendency is usually to say, okay, that's it. And we have to find one more particle, that's the dark matter. In fact, we should be a little bit more optimistic because we know already two components of the dark matter. Neutrinos, normal neutrinos, uh, with 0.70% make about uh, half a percent of the matter of the universe. So this is a tiny component that we know of that exists. And the other thing we know is that black holes do exist. So we know that there are black holes out there and they do contribute to the dark matter balance. And so the usual thinking is there's one more thing, one particle does it. It's actually not that clear if you think. So if you make a step back, you can ask questions. What is the missing piece in the puzzle? It sounds like it should be one thing, but actually if you think it could be complex, there could be one or more components. We have no idea. And of course, usually many, many models we discuss, we talk about one thing, but it could be more complex and have you ever two components? So maybe it's a cocktail. Most people in our field say it must be new particles, but don't forget gravity. Non-line theories are certainly excluded, but there are versions of modified gravity which are much smarter, which could do a good job eventually, and one has to be careful. It boils down to the question if the equivalence principle is an effective principle or fundamental principle that is much smarter than mond like theories, and this is much more complex, but this should not be forgotten. And if you believe that it's particles, the next question, which particles, and we have to do a discussion, what kind of candidates you can invent, which meet all the requirements, usually assuming it's one component, sometimes a little bit more complex, et cetera. And once you have a dark matter particle, they could very well be accompanied by other new particles which are unstable, which also would show up in physics in many places. So if you are honest about this uh, situation, it's a very complex open-end problem and what should be, could have anything from a solution with one single particle that does it all, all the way to a complex scenario with many new particles that we haven't have no clue about. So how to go about this? You build experiments, and I guess you know this, there's a story, you go either in, you know, by indirect detection from astronomical sources, direct production by the LEC, and I'm a favor of direct detection, since that's also the most clear uh, test of what's coming to us as, a, as a, in terms of particles and its particles. So the usual nutshell argument is we play billiard with invisible balls. You put some balls on the table, in our case, like xenon atoms. The white ball, in this case, is invisible. You put it in a dark uh, volume and stare at it and, and look at it. And of course, it's a uh, challenge because you need to detect a, a signal or set a limit in a very, uh, very weak interactions. So the first thing you want maximum momentum transfer, which means that the atoms you talk about should have of the order of the wind mass, in, et cetera. There's many other requirements. In addition, should be clean, transparent, should have a high density, no free charges, etc. So many requirements, if you think what it means, it's quite selective. At the end of the day, there's very few solutions, liquid noble gas, 
and one of them is liquid xenon, the other one liquid iron that people use most of the time. And then of course, there's also solid state detectors. Liquid xenon, if you liquefy xenon, it's around 100 degrees, minus 100 degrees. Xenon is actually the rarest stable element on earth and the world annual production is only about 50 tons or so. So having a detector with 10 tons is uh, quite a logistic exercise and also uh, other exercise. The goal is to get a maximum signal for a rare process. So it means you have to have many atoms, make it big, the 10 tons, which I just said to now, or three tons earlier. And of course, it's a rare event, so you have to be minimize the background. It means you have to minimize uh, the natural rate activity extremely low compared to natural rate activity. The numbers usually is a human, an adult human, has usually typically 5,000 nuclear decays per second in his, in, a, in his body. And we're talking about one decay per kilogram a year. That's nine orders of magnitude cleaner. It's a whole art by itself to get materials that are as clean, make them clean and keep them clean, etc. And I only touched this a little bit, but I could give you a, a talk on this alone. So then you look for signals or limits for RIMS, for axons. But with the introduction set, there could be room for surprises. There could be a cocktail, other particles out there, and getting a more and more sensitive detector, you may hit something else that you maybe didn't look for. So that's the that's the add-ons, I'll say, to the, to, to the standard program. So we're pushing into new territory, and I guess many of you have seen that before. This is the usual so-called neutrino floor. It's the WIMP cross-section against the WIMP mass. This is the neutrino floor where solar neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos are limiting, so say yourself, if people call bad, but actually it's not a bad because then you would be starting doing neutrino physics with a, a dark matter detector, which by itself has also interesting options. Then I put this green blob here, which I call the vanilla wimp. That's also not something not based on your model, on Susie or whatever you do. It's a very simple quantum mechanics statement. If you postulate a new particle with mass M for that's 100 GeV, and calculate the cross section, it's by, them, by geomet geometry, it's pi over m squared times some coupling, a gauge coupling, a lambda coupling in front of it squared, and then some model dependent number that tends to be maybe 1.1, 1 .1, maybe 10 to minus 2 or 10 to minus 3. But if, it's, if this number, this model fact is not 10 to minus 10, then the cross section we end up with for this kind of masses is in the 10 to minus 40 something range. That's where what I would call the vanilla argument, vanilla wimp argument, that's where you expect naively to be. Of course, many of you will know that you can change this naive thing, you can push downwards by certain things by making the, the WIMP a little bit more special. Then you tend to enter into scenarios where the, uh, the WIMP miracle goes away, you can still have it, but the WIMP is a little bit of a problem. You can push to lighter masses in if you want, and you can push to heavier masses. So there's, of course, but this is, in my mind, the most justified region, and that's why you want to get there. So use atoms, of the type of mass of 100 GV or so. And then you push in stereo by building a detector like the xenon detectors that I'm going to describe. And the way these limits usually look are in this kind of uh, reddish uh, shape. You have this uh, uh, shape that you see here. On one side, the low wind mass side, you hit the wall. And that's simply the fact that your uh, uh, scattering on, uh, on an xenon atom uh, transfer so little momentum that you and so produces so little light that you actually have threshold, a detection threshold. You can't go lower because it doesn't produce a signal in your detector, so to say. There's other technologies, you know, solid state detectors where you can go lower here, but with these uh, xenon atoms or argon atoms, you're usually ending up here. Actually, a trick later on, which I'll mention to actually push in this area even with xenon, uh, but I'll, I'll come back to that. But it's a naive scattering argument. Down here, this uh, slope here is simply the rescaling. If the wimp is heavier, then the abundance get, gets lower and then of course changes the limits. So you typically have this kind of shape with a minimum typical range around, let's say 30, 50, 100 GV, that depends on, on your detector details. If you make detector geometry, if you change it, then the minimum of the position changes, that has to do with the fact how much light you produce, how much charges you produce, et cetera, and so on. So we want to get in this vanilla wimp air as much as possible and push down here. That was is the goal. And that's actually what we do. And that's what the Excel Collaboration's mission statement is. Our main goal is to push and go for one of the top candidates for dark matter, the WIMP, so to say. It's a, a collaboration has grown now to 27 institutes over the world with 170 scientists, starting off from a small group. And actually was a quite nice organic grow because as we got bigger, the challenges got tougher and it was always good to have 
a dedicated groups with special expertise at it. So it's really a, a really nice collaboration, I must say, that I know, and it really works very nicely like, uh, like a strong team. So the dark matter program then is to, uh, we are in Gran Sasso, in Italy, so I say. That's uh, underground in this uh, road tunnel to, from, to the Adriatic with 3,600 meters water equivalent shielding. So she has side tour in the Autobahn tunnel. Start off with Xenon 10, usually just a small 25 kilogram uh, total mass detector. Became then Xenon 100 uh, with 161 kilograms. And then Xenon 1 ton, 3,200 kilograms. And what you can see is you can say, when you talk to high energy people, they usually say, why do you go so slow in steps if you look at these things? Why don't you just make a detector five times bigger? The point is that as you get bigger, at the same time, you have to get cleaner per volume. So if you make the detector twice as big or five times as big, it's not enough. At the same time, you have to make these materials and everything you build the detector from extremely clean, clean and cleaner. So it's a double challenge, which is really slowing things down here. Now, having this exercise, we said, let's be smarter and let's make this step here from Xen 1 to Xen N to smoother. Let's build a detector, which is actually is, is identical, but let's just first have a smaller TPC in them there and design while we operate this detector, a new larger TPC. And so we build a detector while we run one detector. And when we're done with one detector, we swap detectors and go to the other one. So it was switching gears as opposed to building a new detector. That's why we now talk about uh, spectacular results from Xen one ton, and there's more, more actually coming in the next uh, months or so. And we are actually in the process of starting up Enton now while we do this analysis. It was a very smart thing. That's what the detector looks like. This is uh, Xen one ton at MGS. It was running until end of 2018. So the data taking has ended and we are still analyzing this data. That's so say the system and the goal was initially from Xen 100 to gain two orders of magnitude in sensitivity. And that's been achieved. Over the last 10 years, we improved the sensitivity by a total of seven orders of magnitude. Think about this. How many other fields can tell you seven orders of magnitude in that time scale? That's quite amazing. But it's also true that with every order of magnitude, the going gets slower and tougher and etc. You see the systems here. There's cryogenics up there where you essentially uh, uh, cool, uh, circulate the liquid xenon, purify it, and, and uh, send it back, or divert it to a distillation system where it comes back. Then there's one flow with the data acquisition system, the usual things on where you, your signals are read out, etc. Down there, this ball like things, what we call restocks uh, system, where we can recuperate the xenon into, into the sphere and keep it there uh, to avoid to go back into xenon bottles, which has many problems and risks, etc., which we don't want to do. So we can actually empty the detector in the system and, and go back. But we want to avoid this because this is quite an operation to do this, et cetera, and to store up, et cetera. This is the cryo, cryostat uh, water tank around it. So water is an extra neutron shielding. And inside, you see this uh, big post here. Inside, there's this pipe going in with all the connections into this cryostat. Inside the cryostat, you see the TPC. I've extended one time, you see that the TPC doesn't fill the volume. That was the plan. We, we build the system such where you can later on insert a bigger TPC. Now, look straightforward. But it, of course, has many, many considerations that you have to keep in mind. So when you do dark matter in underground laboratories or any other low background experience, you have to be very careful. What you look for, so we look for recoils in xenon. There's nuclear recoils where something scatters off the nucleus of xenon or electronic recoils where something scatters off the electrons. Your WIMPs, if they exist, can do that. But these processes can also be in induced by alpha, beta, gamma radiation or neutrinos. And those neutrinos and, and neutrons can scatter off the nucleus. So it's not only that you look for a signal, there is background. So the WIMPs would come in and scatter eventually, but then the sun sends neutrinos and they could scatter. And as I showed you just the neutrino force below, so you wouldn't expect the neutrinos to make an effect. Axions and maybe other particles, et cetera. But this should at the moment be too weak to show up according to standard wisdom when we started this experiment. Then there's cosmogenic background. So, uh, uh, High energy particles hitting the atmosphere, creating neutrinos or muons that go into the rock and produce neutrons. Radiogenic backgrounds, so the radioactive materials underground in the rock, those neutrons and gammas, and also the material that you build the detector from is, of course, not absolutely poor. There's some alpha speeders, gammas that are left over. So, what you do to do an experiment like this, you go underground to shield from the cosmic rays as much. 
you put the detector in a shielding like water or polyethylene, as a sort of water tank, then you build a detector inside and carefully, like a Matryoshka-like uh, situation, make every layer cleaner and cleaner. This means that you select materials, which means we you buy samples of material, literally every screen goes in so called gamma screening stations, where you measure what's in them and certify that they're clean enough, and you do uh, treat them in some cases to get them cleaner. Uh, so there's gamma screening, there's also radon screening. Radon screening means that every material that you can get, as clean as you can get, has traces of uranium, uranium and thorium left. And the uranium thorium decay chain has uh, radon as noble gas in it, and radon to 220 and 222 are dangerous because then these noble gas emanate from this material. So if you build a cryostat from some very clean steel, there is some radon still coming out of that, moving with detector. Radon 222 has a lifetime of 3.7 days. Within 3.7 days, it mixes with any portion of your detector in the liquid, moves everywhere, and out of nothing, it can decay in the middle of your detector and mimic something you would want. So you have to avoid this radon, actually something we are heavily involved here. There's this great shielding, as I said, deep underground vehicle systems, water, etc. We also use what's called cryogenic distillation. So we buy xenon as clean as we can get this, this level of 10 to minus 5 impurities, and we clean it down to levels which are even much more, much more impressive. In some case, for example, one ISO like Krypton 85, we can do 10 to the minus 24. 10 to the minus 24 purity means it's one droplet of liquid in the whole Mediterranean. If you can't do that, then you have a background which you can't control. Then we'll analyze the signals and we analyze the signals by doing pulse shape analysis by looking at the shape of the pulses come out of the detector to further discriminate a signal from a background. It's quite a challenge and that's it. And the point here is that these uh, detectors like Xenon or our computers use a very powerful device, so called dual phase TPCs. The idea is it's a pot like here filled with liquid Xenon dark blue on top, there is a gas phase, which is this light blue. On the top and the bottom, we have light sensors, PMTs, which can collect single photons. We have grids here, these uh, dashed lines here, cathode, anode, and, and grid, etc. So you apply a high voltage in this very clean gas here, and it's great liquid. And then when the wimp comes in, it would scatter, shake the atom, the nucleus, or the electrons, whatever it does create the first light pulse that we call S1s being detected by the PMTs. You see, here's the time structure, first pulse S1 from gamma. And then the electrons that are shaken off from the kicked atom are liberated and drifted in the electric field up to the top and eventually reach this gas phase and ripped out and the upper part is actually like a proportional counter and produce a second light, light flash, which we call S2. From the drift time, from the point of reaction up there, you can very precisely calculate the Z component where, where exactly in the, in the, in the, in the horizontal, in a vertical direction you are. And from the light pattern in the PMT in the top and bottom ray, you can reconstruct the X and Y position very precisely. This gives in the end very good, marvelous, excellent three dimensional position reconstruction. Means we can tell within a few millimeters when the detected event happened. So that's very powerful because that allows us to do so-called fetishization. This liquid xenon in this detector is extremely clean. It's much cleaner than the materials around it, which are also extremely clean. But the xenon itself is much cleaner. So what we can do is with this uh, fiduciarization, we can use the computer and simply cut out this blue part here and say that's extra shielding and only use for the analysis the inner part, which is shielded from the clean detector by even cleaner xenon layer. And this is done, this, uh, this fiduciary stage done by doing Monte Carlo simulations beforehand, you fix how much you shield to optimize the signal to background and later on you don't change the fiduciary volume to, to, to don't uh, change anything anymore. Here on the right side, you see a typical picture. These detector components are extremely clean. For example, the light sensor, I can tell because we developed them here with a, the producer together. Every light sensor is about 10,000 times cleaner than average environment allows you but 10,000 times cleaner is still not the nine orders of magnitude we need. So when you turn the detector and look in the total volume, you see there's a lot of petty ferments left over. Only when you start to fiducialize, then you see that you cut out the clean part, of it, and that's the first time what you, what you do. Then there's this discrimination between what we call S1 and S2. You see it here up there, a gamma, which is a little S1 and a hard S2, where a WIMP or a neutron makes them more equal. 
which is very simple from the kinematics. It makes a difference if you kick with a gamma an electron of the atomic uh, shell, or if you kick with a neutron, the nucleus. The kinematics is different, and that produces in this S2, S1 space, different distributions. Right, the nuclear recoil, the red stuff here, this is from a calibration sort, which we inject in the detector. Nuclear recoils tend to have a, a, a lower S2, as it's seen here, while electronic recoils like this one or gamma produce a higher uh, S2. And that's how it is coming. These two distributions have an overlap for a constant S1, so you have to use in the end statistical methods to separate them and to make statements what eventually you can learn from these kind of events that you see in reality. As I said, this is from cal calibration sources, which we inject. A few pictures just to give you the dimensions. This is a drawing of the of the TPC. It's about one million diameter. It's one meter deep drift length. It has about two tons of liquid xenon. The total mass in ten one ton was about three point three tons of it in there. That should quite something. If you want to drift a few electrons from say down here all the way up there, you have to make sure that there's not no other free electron in this volume. So cleaning a tech to the point, getting electro electronegative enough so there's not a single other free electron drifting is not a challenge that can, can give you a feeling what it means. So this is the real TPC from the bottom. You see this PMTs here from the bottom here, all the cables, high voltage signal cables, etc., and so on. These are the PMTs, they are, they are inserted. There's 248 of them. I can tell you, I know every wire of them. We screened every wire to make sure that this thing has altogether one milli background piece. It was a very long process with the producer. Here you see the PMT arrays in a, in a copper plate. You see there's these white structures, PTFE ports that uh, capture the PMTs. And if you look carefully, you also see all these wires here, which are the lower grid, which, which does say are the gate there where, where you where, uh, to shield the PMTs. Just one example, and I can tell you, believe me, there's many other sophisticated sub substances, a lot of R&D that goes in such a detector to make it work. Now, I guess you don't want to hear that, you want to see physics. So what we got with this detector, we got uh, results. One thing was the search for nuclear recoils. That's the left plot here, which is published in this paper. It's the main RIMP search from the lower band, that's the nuclear recoil band. The events we see are these few events down there. There's, there are a few events. And you look up here, there's the color coding, electron recoil is black dots, surface events is leftover events which come in from the leftover events on the surface. Neutrons are yellow, accidentals would be green and rims would be purple. And for all the events in this red area, which is the generic rim area, there's a color coding that shows you how likely the individual event is a neutron or a rim or something else, etc. And you see some of them look more like a neutron, other ones look wimpier, et cetera. But obviously there's no, 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 no clear uh, signal. So that's why we got a limit from that. It's a world building limit we get from that. This was another way to go, then to push the lower wind masses by using the Mikdal effect. The Mikdal effect essentially says it takes time for the electron to catch up after kick. So if a wind dark matter kicks your, your nucleus, then it kicked out, the electrons keep it going around and notice with some delay. And that's so this MGDAL effect is what you can go for. And that's what we did. So in this way, we were actually able to do an S2 only analysis based on MGDAL or nuclear recoils here, et cetera. That's how we were actually able to push in that area that usually is covered by other detector technologies. Quite interesting, but there's still a lot of debate how reliable this numbers is because the MGDAL effect should still be tested extensively in lab situations. But uh, I think on a log scale, I would say this is something you can, tr can trust. Out of this, we got the result of the WIMPs. It's the most stringent result on spin and dependent scattering of WIMP dark matter down to 3 GeV mass. And here you see it, so to say, and there's this difference between the black line and this yellow green stuff. It says difference between signal and limit, uh, exclusion limit and, li and limit, because in the low background environments with a few events, there's difference what you see and what you can exclude. So say. that's nice to see visible in this thing. So then having this detector, we start looking to other signals, uh, et cetera. And then next thing was actually a surprise. We saw something which we, well, we knew which should exist. And we saw the double electron capture of xenon 124. That's a, a, so two electrons of the atoms are captured, converting the nucleus in our nucleus. Two electrons are gone and two nucleons emitted, which means the electronic shell of this new nucleus is in the wrong orbit. And they all fall down, fill up this new orbit. So there's an atomic relaxation process and gamma's coming out there. But that's a standard process that's expected, so to say, but it's an extremely rare process. And we eventually could see that. 
And the amazing thing is that this is a lifetime, which is 1.8 times 10 to the 22 years, which means that this is the longest ever measured direct life process. It's about one trillion times the age of the universe. Again, it's a sustainable process, nothing fancy, but still, I think, uh, quite impressive to have such a, a such a measurement. And that actually explains why it gave us the title page of, of Nature, actually, when we had this uh, story out there. But again, it's nothing new, but it shows the power of such detectors. And be prepared, there will be more neutrino papers coming out of Xen Wanton and Xen Anton. It's going to be more and more neutrino detector, not only a dark matter detector. Next, we were moving on to uh, search for new physics with electron recoils. Here you see the green band here. There's plenty of events. There's a large exposure, 0.65 ton years of data collected. There's a very low background in this regime. We would expect six, 76 plus minus two events per ton and year and kV. There's a low threshold, even lower threshold than for the nuclear recoil. The question is, do we have excess events? In fact, if you look at this pattern, you see S1, S2, it is cut around it. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't see, tell you much, so you have to somehow get the energy of the recoil out of this. That's what's done by doing the energy reconstruction and resolution. So you combine light and charge. S1 produces a certain number of photons, S2 produces a certain number of electrons. There's energy conservation, which means the total energy is some normalization factor, types the number of photons, number of electrons. And then you can actually put in the signal strength S1 and S2 normalized by some detector constants G1 and G2. Once you measure them, you have your energy calibrated. And that's actually shown here. This is with calibration sources. There's the, uh, the charge yield, which is S2, the light yield, which is S1, and the different calibration sources in here, uh, with different energies from, uh, from 41.5 keV up to 1460.8 keV. And you see very nice this linear relation that infers from this kind of relation. It shows that this works very nicely. We catch the energy, etc. We see this anti-correlation that's expected between light and charge, etc. It's perfectly checked. Now that done, and with this energy resolution, we can actually go back to this plot. And for every one of these events, we can do this exercise that we convert the S1, S2 distribution into a recoil energy and an event. So all these events here that you see here scattering around can be converted with this uh, energy reconstruction with a certain precision into uh, recoil energies. Next, of course, you want to make sure that you understand your detector once you have the spot. So you do calibration. And detector calibration was done in the following way. We inject into the liquid xenon uh, radiative sources. In the past, we used uh, solid sources for the larger detector xenon, one ton of anton was liquids or gases that we inject and mix with the xenon. And two, we choose elements that are short-lived enough to decay in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few hours, a few days, etc. It's another problem. So this is an example of radon 220, which is short-lived. Radon 222 would not be good. So we inject it, and we have this, uh, these data points here, as uh, shown here, including the threshold area, etc. So this, uh, the red curve is our best model that we have from analyzing our detector components, doing Monte Carlo simulations, our expectation. So it perfectly fits within statistical fluctuations, including here at the threshold area. So many detectors have uh, an issue to understand the threshold. We have a different, uh, quite a number of data points, not on these ones in this threshold area. So we do believe that this, this red curve is reliable, including down there here where you, where you see it. There's no large systematics. We, we assume here an unbinned likelihood framework and we do the same kind of analysis for the real data. So there's no biases whatsoever in this kind of thing. So the calibration checks that we do understand the detector response and the three also in the threshold there. Next is what kind of backgrounds do we expect? That's the sort of background model. You have here a background prediction in the interval from one to 210 kV. This is based on all the information we have on this detector. It's based on knowledge from material screening. Material screen means that every screw of these detectors has been screened beforehand and put in a database. It depends on control measurements. So we take samples, for example, the xenon, f bring it to Heidelberg, and measure it very precisely and control how clean the stuff is. We do GN4 simulations uh, of the whole stuff that we know. We smear the real detector effects, et cetera. And then at the end of the day, a certain picture, what we expect in terms of backgrounds in this detector. This model has 10 components, and here you can see the plot. There's in internal backgrounds like LED 214, the blue stuff here. 
you see the color coded here. There's crypto A5, which is usually distilled out, but some relics, etc. There's these Xen isotopes, which you have to deal with. This is uh, double beta elements, etc. There's Krypton 83M, which is actually something we was let's say uh, uh, some leftover from a calibration source, which was small enough, etc. There's neutron induced uh, components here. There's solar neutrinos here, the, 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 the brownish part here, that's down there is the solar neutrinos, so they're still two orders of magnitude below the normal backgrounds. There's materials, this is this uh, purple type line here, that's the leftover stuff from the materials after shielding with xenon shield, etc. And you can see there's also this peak here from what that we expect from xenon 131M. There's this peak here that we expect from, from this krypton 83M, etc. And there's some structure that comes from beneath elements. This word curve is what we expect. And we'll be later on very uh, good check if that actually is signal detector. So that's the expectation. And when you turn on the detector, measure your signal, you want to see if it works all the way because that's a consistency test. Next, you select your data. Science 1 1 is what we take. So this time interval with 226.9 live days. We choose before we actually analyze the producer volume from, as I said before, Monte Carlo running. You have a certain understanding, you run the Monte Carlos, fix it, and don't change because this is what it is. This red sort is one ton fiducial. If you open the, the, the data set and then later on adjust it to the fiducial volume, you would have a selection bias because you can shift the boundary, to get more or less events, etc. cetera. They have a load back on experiment. So this is done beforehand. There's no change after this is fixed, it's done. So there's a fiducial volume is, is chosen. Similarly, the energy range for single scatter events is fixed. That's here from this interval. There are data quality cuts, which I have no time to discuss what kind of data are discarded because of backgrounds in the signal Monte Carlo. And of course, we include our reconstruction efficiency and the threshold uh, of our detector. And that's shown here. There's the detection efficiency versus energy, uh, what was detected and selected, et cetera. Uh, and, it's, and it's fully consistent. Now, when you look at the data, you see them here. You see all these events down there. They are certainly there. But this is not what you look for. This is the materials that you see. Right? You see those events down there. That's also not, not, not what you see. We'll see. Now I can ask, how is the distribution of events? And that's interesting. So you can look at the events in the fiduciary volume from top and side in two intervals. You can, in the interval of 1 to 220 kV, and in the interval from 1 to 7 kV. And in one, the 1 to 7 kV, you only look in the fiduciary volume. And the main message is, it's going to be later on interesting to look in this volume. So the interesting part is, is everything in the fiduciary volume equally distributed? or is there any sign of leakage or geometry effect? And what you can see here, that the you have these effects here out there in the, in the high energies from the materials, but the low energy part in the individual volume, everything looks randomly distributed flat, so say if you take it in, in Z and in X and Y. So there's no preferred position, no, no point, et cetera, that sticks out. Now with all that said, you can put all of this together take all these electron recall events and make a plot where you show the, uh, the number of events versus the electron recall. And that's shown in the next plot here. That's the results, you see. This is again this expectation from our simulation. And you see now only showing a small set from 0 to 30 kV, so it's not going all the way up. I will show you some st expected fl fluctuations, statistical scatter. But then there's, as you go to the lower energy, then there's this increase of data points before then the threshold comes in. So with this exposure, the signal scatter events, et cetera, everything at high energies very nicely agrees. But at low energies here, you have this excess between one and seven kV. There's 285 events observed, but we would expect 232 plus minus 15 from, from our best, best explanation. Of course, this gives you, this said, it gives you immediately one explanation. This could be a, simply a 3.5 sigma fluctuation happens, so what the heck. It's okay, you can take that attitude. But of course, it makes you think because uh, it's almost the boundary where I say maybe something else is going on. So next thing is you look at the background and say, maybe they have some background that they understand. And that's what actually what we do here. There's a, this is actually, these plots here show the background fit the real measurements. The data points, the black dots are the real measurements, right? And this is the background which I just explained. Uh, but you should notice that this measured background from the real data follows the expected background from our, all our material screening and preparation, et cetera, extremely precisely, all these curves, right? So we use, uh, it's fully consistent with expectations with an with maximum likelihood fit, profiling of all the nuisance parameters, et cetera, that gives you this number. However, as you can see, there's down there, 
there's this extra effect that I was just mentioning. Right? This is this down there is there, there's something going on here, and that's exactly a stinger. And now, if you see that, you can immediately take the attitude. So maybe there's some unexpected new background, something you guys missed that you didn't put in your background, and now you see it as a new effect. Now, if you know nuclear physics and inject some element that comes to your mind, the first thing that happens most of the time, they get contributions in different places here, not only down there at the slow energy. So there's not many options to do that without screwing up the, the, the pattern up there. But of course, it is an option, and you should think about that. And we, we actually thought very hard. In fact, we spent almost half a year from seeing this before we published it, said very hard. And there are, in principle, options, and we also highlight them. And it's not expected. And let me explain one example how the discussion goes. So these kind of backgrounds are not expected, but being discussed. So one example is tritium. Tritium would make such a signal without screwing up the high energy part of the background. So when you talk about tritium, you have to know where it's coming from, where it's going. Tritium is produced, the source, it's made by cosmogenic activation above ground and underground from the flux of high energy particles impinging on the Earth. It's, it's impinging on the xenon atoms in the atmosphere that are used to produce the xenon that we use in our detector, above ground and those underground. It's also impinging on all the materials, like the, the detector materials, the pipes which you use, above ground and underground. The equilibrium would be reached after 10 or so years when the lifetime of, of tritium, but never ever any material reaches equilibrium because the xenon is not 10 years on the surface before it goes underground detector, and the pipes are made from materials which typically uh, steel or so, which comes from ore, which comes from underground, etc. So it's a, you can have an estimate, but it's not clear how much tritium actually is in a specific material that you get, etc. If you take something that's been sitting for a hundred or thousand years somewhere in a fixed place, then you can actually calculate the equilibrium. That's not what we have, don't have. But once you go underground, the equilibrium is much lower, so underground you don't produce more. So we buy the xenon, and then we take the xenon as a certain activity that we expect, et cetera. And then you can go underground and, and see what happens. But this tritium is alone because you, there's another uh, element, I mean, hydrogen, and we know hydrogen pretty well. And from that, from hydrogen tritium, we can do some consistency checks, right? So what we do is what we expect is that tritium activity that's expected is, is shown here in this plot here. As you produce it, it goes up then, above ground, if it sits there, there's more produced. Then the, the xenon goes underground and then starts to decay. Of course, in this time scale, you don't see much because 10 years are much longer. Then condensation means that we, we, we cool the xenon and circulate it in, in, our, in our system where getters and distillation take hydrogen-like components out, including tritium. For example, the question is how is it, in what kind of chemical form is it? Is it in, in is it THO, so it's H2O, the water, there's THO, etc. but in other ones, but these getters and distillation process take it out and we have a very good control of what, what happens with water. And from our knowledge of water, we would expect that the tritium concentration is down there at this blue point here, which I'm pointing at. Now, if you simply assume that tritium is in our detector, you can do what's shown in this little plot here, just assume a component, this uh, brownish type of dust uh, curve here, then you add it and it does what it does. So it would mean there's a three point two sigma, and in order to explain that, what we see would take three tritium atoms per kilogram of xenon. But again, we don't expect that. That's not what we expect from our knowledge. The difference is that unlike for other isotopes, like crypto 85, we can't do here the loop. We cannot take a sample and measure tritium at this kind of precision in a sample that we take from the detector. This is from all the knowledge, the indirect knowledge we have. For elements like krypton-85 or so, we take samples, measure it, and can exclude that as tritium-85 in the detector. But here we, we, we can't do that. But again, from all we know, it doesn't make sense, even though it would give you a fit, so to say. The same can be done for other isotopes like argon-37, etc. and this is ongoing discussion. So, but this is an explanation, as I said. So explanation two is some unexpected background that may have not been missed. And don't forget that we improved over seven orders of magnitude. So we get deeper and deeper in the jungle, maybe something that nobody has thought of, etc. So we keep this as a very important option. And I will say more about this uh, in a while. The more exciting options, of course, for a theorist is new physics. And of course, that's the kind of thing that always could happen somewhere. You step on something new that shows up first in these days with long timescales as a 
three sigma effect and you don't know what you should believe in. So let's maybe play this a little while. So the first question is, if there's a signal, where does it come from? It could be the sun. And we know there's neutrinos coming from the sun. It's existing. But we know that coherent neutrino scattering is too small. The neutrino floor is still two orders of magnitude away. But of course, you could say may, make the neutrinos uh, culprit by saying, let me assume that the neutrinos that impinge on our detector have some non-standard detection with electrons that make the signal. That's one route you can think of. And there's more to say in a moment. The other thing is, of course, that people discuss is axions or arcs coming from the sun, produced in the sun. You wouldn't expect that, etc. But if you just take it as an assumption, you can maybe explain things, right? If it's at the sun, what else could be the source? Of course, you would, could relate it to dark matter, even though it's not a WIMP signal. So it could be some new particle, not WIMPs, because they would be different. It could be uh, some particle that's light, for good reasons, which I say, uh, but not be hot dark matter. So it could be maybe a subleading component, where maybe the dominant in dark matter is WIMPs, but there's maybe a certain fraction which is hot and not uh, behaves in an unusual way. Some light new bows and things like that. I will say more about this. You can also talk about diffuse backgrounds of some invisible particle that has certain properties, etc., and so on. And of course, in all these cases, you're going to discuss is that what you discuss consistent with other limits of searches from other experiments in the laboratory or in astrophysics and cosmology? And this, of course, immediately explains why, up to now, within a few months, there's been now 100 or 175 papers which cite our result. And most of these papers are theory papers speculating, speculating on this uh, possibility. And there's three main directions, namely axons, neutrinos, and light bosons. In fact, when this result came, I made a big effort so that the collaboration doesn't overstate and doesn't create a big fuss. So we kept very carefully pointed in these three directions. It could be statistics, could be background in physics, and all of them are equally good. So we were very careful. But we also then put in our publication these three explanations, at least the first level explanation. So if you go solar axons, that's the exercise you can play, ignoring everything else, just from a certain experiment perspective. There's three ways to produce the solar axons, the ABC process, the Primakov process, the iron 57, and detection would be the, via the axioelectric effect. That's your cross section. And when you play with that and don't care about how many axions are made, just put it in, so say, uh, and, and then we'd get a, a, a rate prediction like this. The ABC would give you that shape. You can see it nicely peaks at lower energies. Primakov would give you that kind of shape. That's the iron 57. That said, normalization free, you can immediately play the game. You can immediately try to use these three components to fit your excess. And that's what we did. So these are the solar, it's the solar accent fit here with the three components here. There's the uh, three components. And if you add them here, you see, if you add that, you get a nice fit. And you see, you need some, an ABC component here. And even this iron 57 common component fits nicely if you want that, et cetera, and so on. So you get a very nice fit and would be a 3.4 sigma, sigma, sigma signal, right? But of course, it was immediately pointed out, and we also knew that there's immediately tension with other things, maybe with solar, solar cooling and solar neutrinos. That's actually shown in, in, in our paper already. This is the blue area is what we would need, so in terms of coupling and coupling space. Panda X and Lux before put limits here. Now we here, so say, would see that, so we're consistent with that, we would not violate them. But the cooling of red giants and white dwarfs put limits down here, and this would exclude all that power space. Only that corner up there would be left, and that's excluded from solar neutrinos, uh, physics, etc. So all that's left is down there, and that's not consistent with what we would need. So obviously, this simple explanation is not, uh, uh, not what, it, what it is, and it was immediately pointed out by different people. So the question then is, are there ways around? Well, there's some papers that people come, so say you just go away from simple models, so to say. And uh, for example, here, see this kind of paper here. So uh, extend one excess for normally free action like dark matter and see if they the cooling. So these guys so wrote down the model, et cetera, and they actually succeed to get the, the white dwarf and, and red giant cool explained simultaneously. And they even claim that with their model, they can fit those cooling data even better than without them. So that's the kind of exercise you get. My personal attitude is if you take some new particle, some one new thing to explain something is nice. If you have to add two things to make something happen, it makes you feel a little bit, let's say, skeptical, at least me. Anyway, that's uh, one route you can follow. And there's more papers that people uh, do, do than that. Second is an uh, option is that neutrinos behave in a different way. 
And one way to go is to have a large magnetic moment. So again, you just take it, the cross section, don't care about the normalization, just put some magnetic moment there and have this kind of cross section. Take the solar neutrino spectrum, which is MEV ish, and put it in with a random number, etc. And that's what you get. So you can uh, essentially fit these kind of things by adding this component down there here, the uh, magnetic moment component, and that's what you do. So this is the magnetic moment would be 2.8 times 10 minus 11 Bohr microtons, which is way bigger than what people expect, but much smaller, well, significantly smaller than what the limit is, right? So the question is, as an experiment, you can fit that. The interesting part is what you expect on the theory side. The theory side, in the standard model, with a right neutrino added, for a Dirac neutrino, you get this kind of expectation, a magnetic moment would be this. So expect something at three times 10 to the minus 20 Bohr market, and many, much, much, much smaller than what you would need here. And of course, the normalization is the neutrino mass in terms of 0.18 volt doesn't make much of a big difference. So a Dirac neutrino will not do the job. If you go to Marana neutrinos with transition magnetic moments, it's even worse than they end up with 10 to the minus 23. So with Adding a right hand neutrino only in the standard model, you cannot uh, resolve that. This is way too small to explain what, what's seen here. But of course, it's known that BSM models do enhance magnetic moments. For example, in the MSSM with a lepton ovulation by R parroting by violating couplings, the lambda prime, we get these kind of contributions where LL is a SUSY breaking uh, trilinear coupling, and this ML tilt is a lepton mass, you get these kind of relations, and you get numbers. But generically, unless you tweak the numbers, you get something like less than 10 to minus 13, and you have to explain 10 to minus 11. That brings up the question, is this rather general or generic? And I would say this is rather, rather general. Most PSM models with TV scales new physics predict this 10 to minus 13 or less. And that actually is very systematically, can be very systematically understood, because pushing higher with the magnetic moment often leads to two problems. I did forces you to make new particles that should have been discovered lighter, and that's not what they can accept. And the second thing is there's an intrinsic relation between the magnetic moment operator and very different masses. So this is a magnetic moment operators, but you can have either diagrams which are not forbidden, which are themselves the magnetic moment, or at least if you have this diagram here, you can close the loop and the entire order make a magnetic moment out of that, etc. No true mass out of that. And the point is, if you choose a magnetic moment that's 10 to minus 11, these diagrams produce neutrino mass shifts, which are much bigger than what's allowed from experiments, what we know. So the point is that these, uh, if you don't do anything about this, there's an inconsistency with this similarity of the neutrino magnetic moment with neutrino mass rated corrections. That's why it's a problem. But of course, there's ways out, and that's actually why I did some work, because, uh, et cetera. So symmetries can avoid the problem. Which are this, etc. The symmetries for neutrino mass patterns, those symmetries that people use to explain the neutrino mass patterns, flavor symmetries, continuous discrete symmetry, etc., have an impact on the neutrino mass magnetic moment relation. That's been observed uh, by, by many authors that we have there. And that's why we wrote the paper exemplifying this, which, for example, take a horizontal IC2 broken by the mu and Yukawa coupling. And the main point is that magnetic moment operator has this structure but the mass operator is this structure. And if you look at it, it's different. So the mass operator is not invariant. So if you have the symmetry, the neutrino mass is zero, while the magnetic moment is finite. So in the SC2H limit, you have a magnetic moment without the neutrino masses. Then we do corrections. You can turn a tiny neutrino mass and have the large magnetic moment. Very elegantly brings the data under control. The nice thing, if you play this kind of exercise, very often you get new particles, in this case, scalars, which would show off at the next, uh, in the next runs of the LFC. Here, for example, the scalar masses would show up in, in the next LFC runs. So it's a very interesting route to discuss. The price, of course, that is say, there might be a smart relation between neutrino mass patterns and the magnetic moment. That's just an option, and maybe there's some connection, et cetera, and so on, so on. The third route is then bosonic dark matter. That's also what we discussed in our Xenon paper already. So axion-like particles or axions not related to the, uh, to the, uh, the strong CP problem, but themselves interesting with such a route, et cetera. And you do expect the monoenergetic peak around the rest mass. So if you just inject some mass, you expect such a peak. And of course, the question you may say, well, if the peak were here at 150 or 160 keV, how would that explain this upturn of your signal close to the threshold? Of course, you can choose a mass, which is close to the threshold then, and do it. But that starts to smell a little bit like you adjust the mass to be exactly where it goes to the threshold, etc. So I would distinguish scenarios where this mass is chosen to be right where it has to be, 
from scenarios where you automatically get this kind of pattern. And automatically means that you talk about even lighter products where you see the onset of this peak while the peak is even lower. Now those models that actually choose a mass to be at this threshold of Xenia I think are a little bit cute squared in my, in my notation. And then there's many solutions. Once you go with this, the rest of it is very simple. Choose a toric sector, some light products or the weak coupling. And there's a whole list here and many more which I just put there. And I just want to pick the few to highlight the kind of discussions and, and, and ideas people come up with. So one is to have a light dark sector and there's a, a, a corresponding electron request spectrum. These are these gentlemen here and there's others. And I'm sure there's somebody in the audience here wrote papers and apologies if I don't cite all of them, but it's just to give you an idea how the logic goes. So there are some light particles and so, so there's new, a new neutrino interaction with leptons mediated by a light vector particle. And here you see what it does is the data points, so the, our own curve, and then adding this kind of stuff. Here this thing, you, you get this tension. It's shown if you have this, uh, the mass here and the coupling here, uh, this reddish color is the one sigma loud region. The blue one is a two sigma exclusion. Seeing can also be the texonal limit, the gamma and coaxinal limits. So this is perfect okay. I think the main point is a certain coupling that you need to choose. And the other thing you see here, the mass, it ends here because if the mass would get higher, then the peak would move to higher energies and you would not find it as a good fit anymore. So for these low masses, well below the recoil energy, you get this onset of the on, onset of the signal, which nicely works, etc. It's consistent with all the laboratory limits from other experiments, and it would mean that experiments like Texona, Gamma, Perxino are just about uh, around the corner, maybe to see something. Another idea is to have dark matter products with a fast component, this gentleman, for example. So the idea is to have elastic dark matter electron scattering. And you assume a dark matter with initial velocity, V dark matter, and that's so say what you do. The point is that what you assume is that this velocity is, uh, is much bigger than what you normally take. So you take something 0.1 times the speed of light. That's so say not what you expect because these fast components would be gravitational bound to the galaxy. So this is a component which is fast and not the kind of dark matter that spawns the galaxy. So it would be typically scenarios where maybe a large fraction of dark matter, wimp-like, whatever, is bound to the galaxy, but there's somehow a component that's moving fast, that's coming in, impinging on this detector, and then you can very naturally from these climatic relations get such recoil, uh, recoil patterns as shown here. If you do the fit the mass against the velocity, you see again, so say, if you make the best thing is you make the mass here in this regime here, where the signal naturally has this upturn. If you make things heavier, then the, the, then the shape is sort of not as favorable for you. I think it's again the same thing. It takes some light particle that comes in and does your, does your scatter that way. That's what it would point to. Another nice idea is some heated MEV scale dark matter. That's actually quite cute, so say. These guys, this gentleman said that uh, there's dark matter coming in into the sun, and in the sun, by thermal process, it's scattered, and the scattering, so it produces uh, uh, with light dark matter particles, would be upscattered to KV energies. So, so this process has this mechanism has been mentioned before. So what you get then is there's an upscattering to energies which are typically KV. So here it's shown for different uh, for different form factors. So say and you see if you take the form factor in this, so in this case you can get explains that things. The nice thing is, so say, is that the expected best fit, so say, is just around the corner for Xenon, so let, we should soon see some signal if that were the case, etc. And you especially would expect an annual relation because that's what was connected to the sun and the sun distance, which would show up as an annual, annual modulation. Yet another thing is boosted dark matter. These are these gentlemen here. So again, so say, it, uh, uh, this is uh, particles with velocity which are much higher than Visualized dark matter, it's some, something similar to what we had before. And they also find that you can explain this peak by, do, by doing so, say, have this component, etc. So it's good the flux in this case with origin from the galactic center or from the halo dark matter by annihilation processes. So you would have some processes where normal dark matter annihilates, makes a fast component, that first component would impinge your detector. Uh, that would also lead to a, a modulation, a daily modulation. Because with these parameters, the Earth would be partly uh, shield that, and of course the rotating Earth would then uh, have a, a, a make the free streaming length modulate the signal. So that would be a, a daily modulation that you, that you would like to look at. There's more direction there because the time I skipped this one. 
There's an interesting paper here. Is there a connection with a Dharma signal? There's this long standing Dharma signal, 12.9 uh, signal, sigma annual modulation, where people debate if it's there or not. I think the point is it's clear that there is a modulation. It's uh, most people don't believe it's dark matter. Now, if you talk about unusual things like I discussed before, you may come back and say, maybe these guys were lucky and saw something that we didn't expect. The usual argument is you see this modulation. And the, once you have this few percent modulation, the animal modulation, you see the overall signal at a factor 100 below should be visible, and that's not been seen. So I guess you know this, etc. So one way that was proposed out was to have dark matter particles with scattered electron, leptophilic, etc., uh, would have been by Dharma, etc., and not others. But that also was ruled out by both by Xen 100 and Lux later on, showing that this is not a solution. But now we're back to the question, maybe some other way of interaction that doesn't show up in this expect, but now, now you step on it, right? And that's been actually studied by these gentlemen here, by these two groups here. So could Dharma Libra be the same physics as seen by Xen Wanton? So you assume some, some dark matter that might explain Dharma Libra and calculate what Xen Wanton should see in the electron recurve spectrum. And the, the plots that you see here is, et cetera, what you get does not look like what's been seen by Xen Wanton. You can look in the assumptions there, they're rather generic, but this is an argument that the two issues are not connected, at least for this. Doesn't mean that one couldn't come up with some other idea, some other form of dark matter where this is connected. Never seen it. Could be an exciting thing. So it's ongoing uh, discussions, I would say. So let me summarize the current situation. There is the success where we really worked hard for the background to make sure that we do not miss anything. And we believe, we are very confident we understand what goes on there. And there are three potential interpretations. The first one is it could be simply a three sigma like fluctuation, it means you have to collect more data. That's what I will argue in a second. The second is there could be some new background that even though we don't believe it could have been missed. I believe it's not the explanation, but who knows. And the third one is of course the new physics and I just gave you a, a few examples, etc. And there's no way to cover all these hundred plus papers, theory papers in two months. And I think there's lots of things to be done. It's of course fun to think on the theory side. So as a theorist, I, I still do that and I have some papers in the pipeline, etc. But it's also fun to think about the experimental side and, and with Xen we are moving. With Xen we are now moving to the Xen Anton upgrade. In fact, while we are talking here, this new detector Xen Anton has meanwhile been filled. It's full with liquid xenon. We're doing commissioning and we are pushing to make this detector operational as soon as possible. And that was possible because we are, as I said, we are switching gears. We built the stuff while this guy was running here. We use many existing components which existed, were operated and tested. And that's actually was quite, is quite important because when we turn Xen one ton on, it's a long learning curve to understand all the components. So getting a factor 100, we had an, now another factor 20 in sensitivity, I think pays off in the end. Uh, for example, our competitors LZ, which also will turn on in 2020, they go for a factor more than 1,000 in one step. And that's quite a challenge, making one a factor 1,000 sensitivity, et cetera. So we have some new components. That's, of course, a lot of work, et cetera. And uh, that, that's going happen. So I could say the detector is ready. There's only one little piece that we still have to change. And that's actually this cladding here, this picture, because the picture on the water tank still shows the old small TPC, and that's the last piece that needs to be, uh, have to be adjusted. Now, once we run the detector, what do we check? The, how can we check the situation? First of all, it's in one end on, we have, we'll have much more statistics within a few months. Those in Z, if they turn on, we'll also check this. So if it's a fluctuation, the first question is, does the signal persist? As you run now, you should see it. If the signal persists, does it show an annual modulation? If, it's, if it is as an annual modulation, is it in phase with a distance of sun? So then it would be some solar source. Is it in phase with a preferred direction of the dark matter flow? So don't like those. So annual modulation is important. I can tell you, we have a plot where we show the annual, we look at the annual dependence of our signal. But of course, you know that it's statistically not significant. So we don't even show it to get, make people, to avoid that people go into wild speculations and misinterpretations. At the moment, there's not enough statistics, right? But of course, if there's no modulation, there's still a uh, ways to explain. So is there, uh, there are ideas for diffuse particle flows without modulation? Yes, there are. Not only background, but also signals, as in. An important thing is how would the signal scale with the detector surface and volume? What do I mean with that? If, for example, 
we would have tritium, then we have now big a detector, then the signal should scale in a certain way with the surface and not with the volume detector, right? We have a certain change in volume, a different change in surface. If it's a radon or something like, or, or a tritium or krypton 85, uh, sorry, that uh, 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 argon 37 emanated from the materials, it should scale with the surface of the detector, not with the volume. If it's a signal, for example, from the sun, it should scale with the volume of the detector because that's the exposure at the end of the day, right? There's a number of ways to check this kind of scaling, what you should see, et cetera, and so on. In addition, we are doing a lot of tests and developments to understand tiny backgrounds and, 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 and I want them enter better. This is allow us further consistency checks. So we have actually developed in our institute new ways to check even more precise on hydrogen, tritium, et cetera. So we will study the tea production. We have involved the cutting group in Karlsruhe. They have, uh, they have a lot of experience with tritium. So they're involved in these this discussions, et cetera. So we try to analyze the tritium situation more and get even more understanding to also try to better understand what goes on if tritium were the story, et cetera. So we try to measure all these backgrounds like we do with other isotopes. Uh, that's what's going on. I think uh, because of time, I think I'm over, I, if I'm not mistaken. So let me skip to the conclusions and give me a little background propaganda. So the conclusions are the WIM search will continue with an Anton. It's getting ready and you should expect that as of next year, there's a, a running detector which is significantly more sensitive. At the same time, also LZ, the other detector in the US will come, should come up. So next year, there should be two bigger detectors uh, taking some time to learn and commission, but then taking data. Of course, for theorists, then don't forget analysis takes some time. You don't expect results in, in May or June. It's more like towards the end of the year, I would guess. So that will lead to even better WIMP sensitivity. And who knows if this vanilla WIMP scenario is correct, any time you could step on some signal or not. You could have sensitivity to axions being increased. More neutrino physics is going to come. If we send one ton, you will see more neutrino papers. Double electron capture, double beta decay, solar neutrinos, supernova neutrinos, queer neutrinos capturing, etc. Low energy uh, recoil excess may be statistics back on other physics. So the question would be it's going to be more pronounced with more data. Is there any modulation or what else? So, whatever this program has in mind, I think we can hope and look forward to an exciting next year or so from Xen, but also LZ and others. And whatever they find, even if all this is only null measurements, it will have substantial impact on the, the physics that we are looking for, even if you see nothing. Nothing means a lot of things that people think about will be excluded. And if you, of course, it would be nice for an expert to see something, but on the theory side, we have a lot of impact on what, what we are discussing. Thank you for your uh, for listening. Thank you for your patience. Thanks to you, Manfred. It's very clear talk, uh, very interesting one. I'm sure the people is virtually clapping. Uh, is there any comment or question? Just raise your hand or just unmute yourself and just make the question. Hi, may I have a question, if that's all right? Hi, David, please go on. Uh, hi, um, hi, Manfred. Um, thanks very much. That was a great talk. I think, if anything, this shows that you have an experiment that's capable of testing in mean, physics and experiment, and, and especially also in the physics at very low energy now. Um, so, um, I have a question regarding the backgrounds that you showed in page, I think it was in page 21. Yeah, let me go back one second, page 21. Here we go. And I'm, I'm just trying to be super picky here, okay? Because I think your analysis is great. Uh, the signal that you're seeing is at low energies and it's concentrated on a very, very small window of energy, so right? So any problems that you may have in calibration, I don't know, I, mean, I would be very wary with. So I'm looking in particular now at the Xenon uh, 131 uh, peak, all right? Mm -hmm. And what I say in the reconstruction is you, that you have, like the energy of the peak is slightly shifted to the right. And oh. that you see, and that you see, no, sorry, in the other one. Mm -hmm. And that you see in the residual from there, you see a little excess on the left of the peak and a little uh, lack of events on the right. Mm -hmm. um, should I be worried about this? Is the, would well, this indicate any problem with calibration of energy or anything like that? Or is that, that going to be a right? That's, 
Oh, statistical uh, consistent, as I said, there's a 10 parameter flip, so there's different background components, there's 10, 10 disappear. There's some normalization factors that we get from calibration data, etc. So then we, we simply take this unbit maximum likelihood fit, just like you do for a signal. Uh, you don't uh, squeeze anything in, and then what you get is simply the answer. And this uh, fit is a perfect fit. There's no statistical fluctuations, I'll say, that is an excess, etc. The shape that you see is there, etc. The only thing that survives, is, as I said, is this low energy regime that's focused here that, that this uh, sets up. So that's why well, I said. That is, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. That's why we say, if you see, for example, you see all the components that you expect, right? So if you had some excess somewhere, for example, if there would be some excess here where I'm pointing, you would immediately go to the table of nuclear elements and say, what, what is it? What can make an excess here? And, and uh, I, I know some of it by now, but there's experts here that know nuclear physics from back where they say, you know, if there's, a, if there's some excess here, there must be something that is there because it's the nuclear physics there behind that, right? And of course, people uh, have a very good understanding uh, of uh, what's in there. So this is all concerned consistent up to the best of our knowledge. And when this showed up, this uh, we spent really months on pondering forward and backward, checking the calibration, the math, etc. And the essence is that after almost half a year of forward and backward. I would, I would agree in, in, in uh, I mean, almost completely, I think it's great, all right? I'm just worried that the, I mean, you see it in the residuals, that there is in a window of about two to three KV mm -hmm. on the peak of one, you know, one, three, one. Oh, it seems to be slightly shifted to the right, and that, yeah. that's what I—that's what I read from the from the residual. So, um, since what you're saying is an effect of a, a, a low mm -hmm. threshold, I would be worried. But yeah. But I understand what you're saying, yeah. That's exactly what we do, sir. So there could be, as we emphasize, there could be some unexpected background. Right? This is a perfect fit. It all looks consistent up to this up to this thing, right? Explain this thing. Uh, if it, it could be statistics, as we say. It could be fluctuation. If it's real... And it could be some background issue. We have here 10 components, so maybe there's an 11th component. But these 10 components with everything fully consistent very nicely up to this little thing here. This is an excess that survives. So second explanation is some expected background. We are, as we said, we try heavily, but many of the isotopes you can come up with would produce something else somewhere else, etc. So it's not that easy. So there's only a few things. There's tritium, argon-37, that's one of the main discussions now. And it could be, maybe there's a tritium, a way that tritium makes in the detector that we weren't aware of, but this would be the way to go, right? Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, David, for the question. Sven, I can see that you raise your hand. Please unmute yourself and make the question. Yes. Uh, thanks for this really interesting talk. In particular, I found the prospects that you were discussing in the end very interesting and how to distinguish various possible explanations in the future. What about other currently ongoing xenon-based experiments? Can they already say something or should they be able to see something like you are doing or are they too impure with respect, for example, to tritium that they can't see anything? What's the status there? So our background level was, was unprecedented. Nobody ever had this. And I can tell you the new end tech is on with parameters that are mind boggling right? So it's really down to the point, which is where, so the other experiment, what I did, there was, Lux was running, that was like Xen 100, and Xen 100 was cleaner than Lux, right? So that's, uh, the Lux people are, are building the LZ detector, and that's being commissioned and should be filled, I guess, next year at some point. They, everybody was hit by COVID, et cetera, delayed, et cetera. But what I know, they should be coming online and detector commissioning some point next year, you know, I guess, because again, surprise and delay. But I think ne as of next year, we have a second detector LZ, which is similar size. And, and we actually like this because having competition is healthy, makes you move, makes you compare, etc. And actually we, we talk to them on these kind of things and what they think, etc. to make sure. The third detector that is still running uh, is mid-size, is Panda X in China. Panda X has a mass which is between, let's say, 700 and 7, uh, 1 ton, etc. It's almost 1 ton, but Xen Anton is, is much bigger now, right? Xen Anton holds a total of 8 point, about uh, almost 9 tons of liquid xenon. And we have, I can tell you, we have 9 tons liquefied. Yeah, so you don't think that uh, they could add anything there? Are they planning maybe a similar analysis? Or? I think what will happen is the LC. Xenon Anton competition. That will be exciting, right? But Panda X, not. Panda X, they are trying to catch up, but they, they lost momentum, I would say. I would, I would be surprised. Uh, let, let me know, I think many of the things that 
going to take us, but develop by us. Mm -hmm. They benefit a lot from that and pulling the wagon is always harder than, than, than leading the crowd. Just to show you an example, so to say, I shall have these pictures up here. Here, oops, sorry, here they are. These pictures, right? These BMTs here were developed here by Austin Heidelberg together with the Hamas, the producer. I know every single wire, it was a, a year long development, three year long development program. We started developing these PMTs, the organ version for Gerda. And knowing about this, I can give you a two hour talk on the behavior of this PMT alone. Right? And this, every single wire is here, everything was material has been screened. So we get samples, screened them, certified and correct back. And when we were done finally, LZ and Pomex simply buys the stuff, right? Because the producer is not willing to make us a, a special contract that they only send to us, right? So they benefit a lot from that. And so similar things, but we, to be honest, we also benefit from some of their stuff, right? So for example, Lux invented this, uh, this uh, calibration sort with uh, treated methane, which is a nice way. And at some point you say, oh, it's great, let's also do that, right? So there's a mutual benefit, but a good competition, I think that's always healthy to have. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Len. Is there any other question or comment? What people are thinking, I have, a, I have a question. So you probably have read all the possible papers that try to explain the external excess. <laughs> Do you have a theory, theory or approach? Well, I think if you take these three directions, I, I'm not sure if I really can say that I read everything because there's new papers come every day. Some papers I stopped reading when they're cute squared, so that's my attitude. Let's say, as I said, Having such an experiment, you might step at some point with something like you didn't expect, right? So why not? So it's an, I think the theory activity for me is a very interesting exercise to see if it's conceivable or not, right? We have in many experiments like in the LHCP, there's a new signal people discuss it. And there's always the, is it something that takes a lot of tweaking to explain or is it something that could naturally explain now? That's how I see all this activity. And if looking at them, I see different ways how to go. And I see the, I think for the axions, you take typically a two, two, two step solution. For magnetic moments, it takes this connection between adrenal masses and, and symmetries that then you have business. And for light bosons, there's more options. And you see this most of the ways for light bosons. I think that's the overall theory situation. But of course, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be some other explanation that's completely different, right? So I think it's, it's when we had this paper written, my, 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 my expert colleagues uh, said, let's put it out. I, I saw the knowledge. I think we don't, I said, we don't want to have the same situation as the 750 GD story at LHC, this cover page story on big media, and then later on, they failed, right? I said, if there's new physics, the people still give us credit, the theorists will anyway jump on it and study it, which, which will happen. And if, it's, if it turns out to be a background, only statistics, nobody will blame us because we very carefully point all these three directions. And that's, I think, how it should be done. It's good to think about it, but it's also be careful, be, be sober about it, and don't get carried away. Okay, very good. And very politically correct, that sounds good. <laughs> well, I will think. Is there any other comment or question? So if not, let's thank uh, Manfred again. Thanks a lot for the talk. And let's uh, thank everybody for attending this uh, today workshop. And let's uh, reconvene tomorrow. So thanks a lot again. Thanks again. And I really feel sorry that I couldn't make it. So I hope to see many of you guys at Southern Heidelberg and at a real conference over coffee, etc. We will wait for that. Thanks and have fun. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.